When my wife and I passed through the town of Winchell Sea as we were returning home from Rye a few years ago, I found myself rather fascinated by it. We dilly-dallied for about 15 minutes, and I had a look at the big church, and I knew I had to come back for a closer look. Little did I know that Winchell Sea would be one of the most interesting towns I've yet found in England. Here's a secret. What you see here is not where this town started out. Its original location is now underwater. I am a Yank in Sussex. What you see here is the historic port town of Winchelsea, far, far away in East Sussex. Upon hearing this, your first question might very well be, how can it be a port? There's no water anywhere near it. To find the answer, we have to go back in time several hundred years, prior to the mid-1200s. After researching a few old maps, this is my best estimation of the area's layout as it appeared before the marvelous storms later in the century that completely changed the shoreline. This map here is the result of my research, and the best guess as to the layout of what is now known as Rye Bay, as it stood around 1236. It was at this time that the city fathers of Old Winchell Sea petitioned the king for aid in saving their town. The town lay on a massive shingle bank that protected the confluence of the estuaries of the Rivers Breed and Tillingham, and provided a sheltered anchorage called the Camber. At that time, it was about three miles southeast of the town of Rye. On the other side of the anchorage, on another shingle bank, lay the village of Broomhill. It too served as a port, although a minor one. As noted, both Winchelsea and Broomhill lay on shingle banks. If you're wondering what shingle is, a shingle beach, also known as either a cobble beach or a gravel beach, is a beach commonly narrow that is composed of coarse, loose, well-rounded and water-worn gravel called shingle, as seen here. The problem with shingle is that it isn't a very firm foundation. It tends to move with the tide and the sea, and even in our modern times, where we try to build structures to hold it more or less in place, as seen here in the form of these groins, shingle can shift and in very stormy weather it can shift dramatically. Because the town site was becoming increasingly untenable due to a series of bad storms, the town leaders earnestly petitioned the king, King Edward I, for help as the shingle spit on which it stood was being carried away. Sea defenses were constructed, but these didn't help very much, and in 1250 and 1252 there were again very serious storms that did an enormous amount of damage. After further appeals to the crown, in 1276, a royal commission determined that the town should be moved to a safer site nearby. The chosen site was the hill, or island, of Iham, which stood over 100 feet above the bay into which the river Breed flowed. Iham already had a small village with its own church, but there was plenty of room to expand. The site was easily defended, immune to the weather that threatened Old Winchelsea, and so provided a reliable port and a protected anchorage on the River Breed. The old town was quite large at that time, with a very healthy population of around four or 5,000 persons. There may have been, in the 1260s, over 700 houses, two churches, and over 50 inns and taverns. It just couldn't be allowed to be destroyed. Unlike other towns, which had grown haphazardly over the centuries, the town of New Winchelsea was deliberately designed from the beginning with a regular gridiron arrangement of streets. The plan incorporated rules for what we in modern times call zoning, meaning that certain areas were reserved for commerce, others for residence, and still others for other purposes. And, of course, the town's new principal church dedicated to the martyr St. Thomas Becket as was the old church in the old town, was given a prominent plot of land in the very center. It was in 1281 that plots began to be allocated to the residents of Old Winchelsea, and in 1283, building began. This was just in time, because it was in 1287 that the famous storm occurred which totally destroyed the old town. This was the same storm that blocked up the harbor of New Romney and changed the course of the River Rother. 
I discussed this in some detail in my video about the town of Rye. It said that the remains of the original town of Winchelsea were visible at low tide for about five years afterwards, but the location was eventually completely lost. Following the great storm of 1287, there was still a large shingle bank present, but it was greatly reduced. Here is a modern drawing, as if from the air, of New Winchelsea upon its island of Iham. Of course, over time, Iham Island became Iham Hill, as the Breed Estuary silted up, until today there is no water surrounding the hill at any time. Where is old Winchelsea now? Nobody knows for certain. In August 1959, the Underwater Searchers Club of London mounted a scuba expedition, but were completely unable to find anything. The gentleman manning the Winchelsea Museum, with whom I spoke on the day of my visit, said that subsequent technical searches using magnetometers and other such equipment have failed to find the old town too. Nature has erased old Winchelsea without a trace. My own proposed location for Old Winchelsea is a spot about one mile into Rye Bay from the mouth of the modern river Rother. Of course, my best guess has no more validity than anyone else's, but I think it's a decent guess. On the day of our visit, I thought I might fly my drone out into Rye Bay towards where I thought Old Winchelsea might have been located. We drove to the seaside village of Winchelsea Beach, and I launched the drone. I took the drone up to its legal maximum altitude above ground level, or in this case sea level, and scanned the bay to see if the camera could see anything of old Winchelsea. Of course, I didn't really expect to see anything. I was just trying to show just how thoroughly the old town has been eliminated by the sea. Turning around towards Iham Hill and flying in that direction, you can see how the hill stands above the general level of what used to be the water of the Breed Estuary. On the way, we can see the holiday caravan parks of Winchelsea Beach, indicating how important the former shingle beds have become to tourism. After bringing the drone back, we drove towards Winchelsea. I'll describe its current location as approximately 2 miles, or 3.2 kilometers, southwest of Rye. The bluff on which the town stands is 115 feet, or 35 meters, above the breed level as you can see, where today the river breed flows to the Rother and then to the sea. By the way, there is one other Winchell Sea in the world. That other one is a town in the area of Victoria, Australia. The name Winchell Sea is believed by some to originate from the colloquial word Gwent, which refers to the marshland levels behind the town, and the Saxon word Chesel, meaning shingle beach or embankment. The Winchelsea Council says that it was originally called Gwent Chesilee, or the Shingle Isle on the Level. There are apparently some other theories, but this one seems to be the best. How old is Winchelsea? It's hard to say. The Hill of Iham was formerly an island within the Rother Embayment during ancient Roman times, and was a small settlement with a harbor. The ancient name harks back to that, in that the I in the name probably derives from the old Saxon word for island, which it was at the time. This is similar to the town of Rye, whose name derives from the same old word. Iham thus has the meaning of island town or island hamlet. So its deep history goes back at least as far back as 2,000 years. However, in terms of old or new Winchelsea, including the part that is now underwater in Rye Bay, the earliest reliable mention of it is in old documents from the 11th century, or in other words, the 1000s AD. In the south of the main town, here we've taken a left off the A259 road in order to first check out the new gate before heading back into Maine Winchelsea. But first we'll take a look at the remains of St. John's Hospital, a ruin called St. John's Gable. It's just the west gable wall of the original structure. St. John's was one of the three hospitals that were established in Winchelsea. These hospitals, in the charge of various religious authorities, were not for the sick, as the modern use of the word implies, but were charity housing for the old and infirm. The other two hospitals, called Hol Holy Rood and St. Bartholomew's, are now just mounds and dips in the field, now south of St. John's Gable, along with other now lost buildings, part of the southern suburbs of Winchelsea. This is a view from the south via drone, with the main town circled here, and St. John's circled here. 
From St. John's Gable, we're driving southwards down Wickham Rock Lane, which runs downhill to the southern end of Iam Hill. This part of town was quite built up back in Winchelsea's heyday, when the town's buildings reached all the way to the New Gate. Why is it called the New Gate? Presumably because it was built sometime after the other two gates located on the northern end of Iam Hill, or Island. From the New Gate, you can see across Pewis Marsh to Wickham Manor Farm. Its 16th century building, you can see a little bit here, was once owned by William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania in the USA, but it's now owned by the National Trust. A defensive ditch called the Town Dyke was dug across the front of this gate and was spanned by a bridge that no longer exists. This gate was built in the 13th century and was at the time the only entry to the town by land. The ditch was an effective part of the town's defenses, cutting off the peninsula from the mainland and encircling the whole western side as a water channel. It was through this gate, however, that the French are said to have gained entry in 1380, perhaps by treachery. This was probably the most serious of their incursions into Winchelsea during the Hundred Years' War. Under the Admiral of France, Jean de Vienne, they not only sacked this town, but are also said to have burnt Hastings, Appledore, Rye, and Portsmouth. Let's get back to our drive into Winchelsea. Resuming at St. John's Hospital, we pass by a metal fence on the right, on the other side of which was the old Monday's Market. In medieval times, this was where the town held its market days. This part of the road that we're on is called Monk's Walk, presumably because it passes close by one of the old abbeys, called Greyfriars, named after the grey habits of the Franciscan monks who founded it. There's only one part of the old abbey still standing, which is the ruin of the Friary Church's chancel. Unfortunately, it isn't open to the public, but since the manor house next to it has self-catering apartments that can be rented, it might be possible to visit the ruin while using one of them. And so we drive into the center of town, rolling up to the Court Hall and Museum, which is located on the upper floor of the old building. The Court Hall is still used as the meeting place of the ancient corporation of Winchelsea. It was here on Easter Monday each year that a new mayor was elected. The ceremony is now conducted in the more accessible church nearby. Winchelsea Corporation, like the City of London, elects freemen from whom up to 12 jurats are selected annually at the mayoring to assist the mayor. There is also a town clerk, or clerk, <laughs> chamberlain, and sergeant at mace. Winchelsea may not have city status, but because of its importance as one of the ancient towns of the Sink Ports, its ceremonial status remains quite high. It's worth noting that while the mayor of Winchelsea represents the town at ceremonial events, neither his or her honor nor the corporation have governmental powers or local funding, and at least not anymore, and functions not as a government but as a charity. The corporation does have stewardship over the medieval town gates and the court hall. One remarkable display in the museum, which occupies nearly the entire north wall of the museum, is filled with a largely complete list of the names of the town's mayor since 1295. The court hall is one of the oldest buildings in Winchelsea, though it was drastically restored in the 19th century. Parts of it are probably as old as the town itself, and it may incorporate still earlier materials. There is a small charge for visitors to the museum, but it's well worth it. The museum occupies the entire upper floor of the court hall and is chock full of informative materials. Exhibits include maps, models, pictures, pottery, and items relating to daily life. Staffed by knowledgeable local volunteers, the museum is regularly open from spring to autumn with books and other gifts on sale. Ultimately, the most imposing structure of Winchelsea is the large church dedicated to St. Thomas the Martyr, also known as Thomas uh, Becket. This church is rather large for such a small town, which is sometimes called the smallest town in England, but that's because the town used to be much larger in population. Looking at the footprint the church occupies, it's a goodly space, but it appears to have originally been sized as a small cathedral, a bit like Rye. Based on the architectural structures outside the main church, the current structure is about half the size of what it was originally. But it must be said that the full extent of the church is not known for certain. In this diagram, you can see the present extent of the building. But inasmuch as the building was known to have had a large spire or dome over a now-vanished nave, 
uh, the supports of which are still visible, the rest of the structure must have extended westwards a good distance where graves now dot the yard. Why does this church appear to have lost over half its size? It was due to war. The One Hundred Years' War, in fact, mentioned earlier. During that lengthy war, Winchelsea suffered four separate serious attacks, three by the French and one led by their allies, the Spanish. That fourth attack is believed to have resulted in the destruction of the nave and its spire or dome. In the succeeding centuries, there were attempts to repair the church, but it was never brought back to what must have been its original impressive state, and there was a period when the building was in pretty poor repair. This was largely the result of Winchelsea losing its port and prosperity due to silting up. It has been nicely restored over the years, however. One of the reasons for coming to Winchelsea was to visit the grave of Spike Milligan, a favorite comic of mine. I remember reading his war memoirs and laughing myself silly. It's great fun. On the gravestone you'll see in Gaelic written, I told you I was sick, his last joke. Rest in peace, Terence Allen Spike Milligan. There's a lot more concerning Winchelsea that I would love to get into for this video, but due to time constraints, I'm only going to be able to cover one last thing, and that is a part of Winchelsea that I was able to get some drone footage for. On the northwest area of the Iham Hill stands what is called the Millennium Beacon. This was erected as part of the Millennium or Year 2000 celebrations, and it was lit for the first time at midnight on New Year's Eve to celebrate the start of the new millennium. That same area also features the remains of an old windmill that was used for grinding grain. Here in this aerial view, you can see the millstone and some other parts of the structure. The mill was last used in 1905 and was restored in 1935, 1955, and 1982, but was destroyed by a hurricane in October 1987. That weather. If you walk towards the site over the fields, you'll pass various humps and depressions which are all that remain of once busy residential streets. This area also once contained an old church dedicated to St. Leonard. The church was actually the parish church of the old village of Iham that occupied this high ground before Winchelsea was moved to the site in the late 1200s. Even further in the past, below this was probably the site of the small harbor which existed in Roman times. On the days my wife and I visited Winchelsea, I did get some nice drone footage of the town, but for reasons I won't go into, I wasn't able to get all I wanted. I especially wanted footage flying over the main part of town, but that didn't work out. Fortunately, I found some great footage on another YouTube channel called A View Through the Lens by Rob Follow Creative, who had filmed flights over Winchelsea in October 2023. Rob graciously allowed me to borrow some of the footage from those flights. Links to his channel and website can be found in the description of this video, including a link to the full video of his flights over Winchelsea. Thanks a lot, Rob. This has been a production of A Yank in Sussex. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe or follow. Thanks for watching, and may you have a very nice day.